Good evening. It is Hello. great to see everyone. Welcome. Oops, is my is my video working? Yes. Okay, great. I couldn't see myself, but you could see me. Yes. So welcome. Uh, once again, I am Katie Dunn. I'm excited to have you here this week at our Admissions 101. Our topic tonight is course registration. We know this is a particularly key topic for those of you who like to plan ahead and kind of vision the whole four years of high school and how they lead to college. So I'm excited to join you tonight, and I'm going to ask my colleague Maureen to introduce herself as well. Hello, I am Maureen Delaney, and Katie and I work together at Prep Matters as educational counselors. And um, I'm excited to um, help you plan out these four years. You know, as we um, talk about looking to college, I just want to add that um, you're going to do the same thing when you get uh, to begin your undergraduate experience. So that first year of college, you're going to look at your undergraduate four years and plan your coursework, um, much like uh, we'll outline today for high school. Great point. So this is, this is one of those situations um, you might ask in math, when am I going to use this in real life? <laughs> so you, you can use this in real life again. Yep. So welcome. Well, well said. Um, and please remember that if at any point throughout our presentation you have questions, just pop them into the Q&A box and we will make sure that we keep an eye on that and answer them either all together on the air or um, in directly to you. So feel free to do that during the chat. And if you have any questions later, you can see that both Maureen's and my contact information are on the screen. So let's get started. So there are a couple big picture topics that we will keep coming back to as we think about how to plan um, your course load. And those really are academic directions, time management, rigor, along with performance, and what options are available to you. So now you may remember, if you have been with us for several webinars, that we often start this way. Um, this is the chart that is released every year by the National Association for College Admissions Counseling. And it is a table that is compiled with information from surveys they've done with about 400 colleges. Now remember, there are about 3,000 colleges in the US, but 400 is a pretty good cross section. And it tells us, just in a general terms, how different colleges use the different pieces of information that come in your college application. So we've highlighted today, we will be talking about strength of curriculum. And we'll come back and forth to that idea a lot. Part of what you are doing when you are choosing your courses is you are thinking about how strong is my curriculum? Did I take the strongest curriculum that I was offered? And you can see it's right up there near the top. It's right up there with grades when we look at how um, colleges are considering your application and just right above essays and SAT scores. So quick reminder again, this chart is not a formula. There's not a math al algorithm that you can use to figure out what your college application will look like, but it helps us have a sense for overall for the schools where the relative importance may fall. And it gives you a chance to go look at your individual schools on your list as you narrow your college list and see how they individually might rank these different pieces. So um, in essence, I'm sorry, I'm just gonna add, in essence, the colleges are asking, um, did you challenge yourself? They're gonna have a look at your grades, but they're wondering uh, what courses did you select and did you kind of push yourself to learn more? and to um, really investigate uh, um, really rigorous courses. Exactly. So a lot of things we find in our work with students is that a lot of things out there feel like they are facts, but really they are myths. And some of the things that come along with, the, with how to choose your courses are somewhere in between. They're not entirely facts, but there maybe is some information in there that is valuable to think about. So we're gonna look at a couple of the, the biggest sorta of true myths that we see a lot. Do you wanna start with this one, Maureen? Sure, so, so sort of true myth, I need to know what I wanna study in college so I can choose a major on my college oh, application. Sorry. <laughs> That's okay, <laughs> off we go. Uh, so the, um, 
So the truth is that your, your academic direction is valuable. It's valuable information to the admissions folks because they're looking at, okay, what, what did you take from freshman year to junior year? And what does that tell me about you as a student? Uh, remember, this is an academic application. So they're looking, what, what did you select? How did you do? What grade did you earn? Um, but, um, you know, that selection that, um, that can suggest a path that you might be on. So, so the suggestion of the path is valuable. However, um, you don't need to select your major before um, you, you set foot on campus. Now, of course, there are exceptions, and that is sort of the way to go with um, your college research. You'll, you'll note there's always a caveat. So if you're applying abroad to UK schools, for example, that you apply through your, um, through your major, through your faculty or discipline. So that's something entirely different. If you're applying to an engineering school, a nursing school, or a business school, um, so those, those kinds of um, decisions to self-select into those schools, then of course um, it's, it's important. But overall, um, the, the real direction is about you gaining a foundation and um, knowledge across uh, the academic subjects. Apologize for my tech, my sticky fingers today. I'm just popping us through too much. So this uh, is a point that Maureen was sort of starting to make earlier that I think is really important. The sort of true myth that we hear a lot is that I have to choose the absolute hardest chat classes and get absolute perfect grades or I'm never getting into college. And one of the things that happens is some students who set that as their goal um, end up doing a couple things. First of all, they drop all of their extracurricular activities. They maybe also drop their sleep habits. Uh, I have talked to a number of students in, um, in quarantine right now during this time of the pandemic who have told me that they are so much less stressed and so much more ready for their schoolwork um, in, in large part because they are getting more sleep. And so if you start to sacrifice everything else in your life, then having just those grades and those classes is not worth it. Um, and for the most part, actually, this is not what colleges are looking for. Colleges are looking at your transcript in the context of your life and your school. And so they do want you to challenge themselves. That we talked earlier about rigor. Colleges are asking that, to look at your transcript and think, well, where did this child have the opportunity for rigor? And did he take it? Did he take that honors class? Did he take that AP class? But you also want to maintain excellence in your scholarship. You want to find kind of that sweet spot where you have hard classes that challenge you and push you to grow, that maybe make you ask for a little more help, but also where you are still able to master the material and grow and learn in an appropriate way without sacrificing all of the other parts of your life. It's really important to find balance. One of the things that we use when we think about this is called the zone of proximal, proximal development. That part you don't have to remember, but this visual should be helpful. So you want to think about like, if my coursework is all things that I'm like totally sleeping through, I can just handle them. It's fine. Nothing has really gotten harder since I've gone through high school. Junior year kind of feels like freshman year. Probably your course load right now is maybe a little too easy. You don't want to be in a place where everything just comes super, super easily. But if you get all the way to the other end of the spectrum and you find that you are pulling out every study habit you have and you're meeting with your teacher every morning and your parents got you a tutor and you dropped all your extracurriculars and you never eat dinner with the family and all you do is study and you're still getting lower grades in this class than you usually get, still much lower grades than you want to be getting then probably that's not the right place for you. Probably you weren't quite ready to be in that class. So you really wanna be in that middle spot, that place where 
you're pushing yourself, you're working hard, you're, you're learning more about what to do when you are facing a challenge. But once you get that little bit of help, once you maybe have a tutor or to talk to your teacher or work with a study group, you really are able to master the material. That's how you want to be in your classes because that really does show in your transcript. If you, you'll, you'll maintain your excellence, your grades will go in an upward trajectory as your rigor goes in an upward trajectory. And that is exactly what colleges want to see. And I'm just going to make um, a comment on the stripe zone. That's the things you can do with a bit of help. So the psychologist, Vygotsky, who um, was a, a Russian psychologist in the 30s who constructed this idea and this zone, uh, he um, also believed that social interaction was important. This zone where you're guided by your teacher or you're discussing subject matter with your peers. I don't know if you um, have noticed that often when you talk about what you're learning, you realize how much more you know. And actually you, you reinforce um, what you're learning by talking about it and by seeking help from teachers, those guides. So, um, so just to include that this, this um, idea of learning in this zone is about what you can do on your own and then what you can do with that interaction because that will really help you. I often say that um, independence, going off to college is really interdependence. It's, it's being able to ask for help and to um, surround yourself with guides who can help you to the next, next step. Oh, that's so smart. I'm so glad you brought that up. Human beings are social creatures. So what we hear all the time, this is one of our favorite, favorite, not favorite questions. We hear this from students all the time. The question is, what's better to get an A in an honors course or a B in an AP course? What do you think, Maureen? Well, I think it's best to get an A in an AP course. <laughs> <laughs> The answer, the answer we always give. <laughs> because you're looking for that AP course that matches where you are and you're able to be masterful and, and uh, complete the course with excellence. So here's one of the reasons that we believe so deeply in the fact that you shouldn't just take every single AP course that you're allowed to do. And I know this slide's a little bit hard to see, so we've added a couple of animations. But um, a couple of years ago, University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill did a big study that looked at how many college level courses incoming students had taken in high school. And they were looking at AP courses, IB courses, International Baccalaureate courses, and courses that will be called dual enrollment, where you have an opportunity to take a course that is officially offered perhaps by Montgomery College, but you're taking it with your high school. So they looked at how many courses you had taken in your high school all four years, not just junior and senior year, but the total number of college level courses you had taken. And then they mapped that compared to your freshman year, end of year GPA. And what they noticed is, if you had zero courses of have college level material, your end of year GPA was usually around a 3.0, 3.07. Now remember, these students are at UNC Chapel Hill, so they are high achieving students. Um, and also remember that there's enough students at UNC Chapel Hill who didn't take any AP courses and were still able to gain admission and do well in their freshman year. But every time you added a course, if a student had taken one course, they end up somewhere in the 3.15 range. If they had taken two, all the way up to if they had taken five courses, they noticed a, a qualitative difference in their end of freshman year GPA. If you had taken five AP or honors course, AP or uh, IB courses in high school, it suggested that you were maybe a little bit more prepared for college, that you had a little bit more of the college ready skills that you needed. But look, so the, if you have five courses, you ended up with a 3.26 GPA on average. And if you had 10 courses, you ended up with a 3.25 GPA on average. So it really starts to even out right around five or six courses that there doesn't seem to be any additional benefit to your success in college 
from taking these college level courses. And these are and, not all in the same year. Right, right exactly. These are all throughout your four years. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's important because I think when students hear us say, and we say it all the time, that rigor matters, that you need to take hard courses, that you need to challenge yourself, I think most students are thinking about getting into college. But in fact, the reason colleges care is because they know that it prepares you for college, that taking those courses give you the skills that you need. In fact, there has been a lot of study that demonstrates that though there is a correlation to your success academically in college with your grades in those, with, with, sorry, with taking those college level courses in high school, there's no correlation uh, with how well you did on the exams or what your grades were in those classes. So really it's about the experience and learning the study skills. And it turns out you kind of get enough of that with five or six classes. And so colleges know that and they don't want you taking 27 APs just for the sake of taking them. You won't be as successful in all of the other parts of your life. The idea of balance that Katie mentioned in the, in the last slide. So we're at the, the idea of balance again. What you want to do is look to see what does your high school offer and then how can you create a balance in your own schedule and in your own pursuits um, that challenges you but also gives you reward and inspires you to go and learn more. Right. So ultimately what we're Continuing to remind students and what the research shows is take, take that challenge on, take hard courses, but find that balance. Find your success, most successful spot, giving yourself some space for all of the other parts of development because that is just as important when you get to the college application. UNC is a great example. They always have a couple of really clever, interesting essay questions because they really care about who you are as a person. And if all you've ever done is desperately take every AP class that your school offers, you won't have quite as much to say. So sort of true myth, students who go to better high schools have a better chance of admission. I, that's in quotes because I think we all kind of get a little bit prickly when we talk about some schools as being better than others. Um, but Maureen, I'm going to go back to your point. Um, if you could tell us a little more, you started talking earlier about how colleges want to look at you in the context of your high school. So colleges won't expect you to take AP courses if your school doesn't offer AP um, classes and exams. So they, um, your school will send what's called the school profile with your transcript when you apply and that school profile is kind of the key and it guides um, the admissions folks on how to read your transcript. So that key is really important. That's um, the, the structure of the curriculum of your, of your high school so they won't have expectations outside of what um, your high school offers. So that you want to look and um, say, okay, how can I challenge myself um, within, within the, the boundaries of my high school? You know, how can I, and if you're hitting the limit, um, then you can go on to dual enrollment with your community college or, um, you know, seek additional higher level classes um, in, in a way that suits your particular interests. So when you think about your school, some of the things that will come up if you're a younger student, these might be some terms that you're starting to hear. Some schools have, as we've said a couple times, advanced placement courses. Other schools have international baccalaureate courses. Um, these two programs are considered to be similar in terms of college admission. They are slightly different in scope and how they are approached in the school. IB tends to be seen as more of a program, so you might be expected to take multiple IB courses. AP tends to be a little more uh, separated, so you could choose to take the AP courses that fit most what you are interested in. Um, in this area, we also have a number of schools that have magnet programs where you are from day one advanced in the arts or in media studies or in the environment. And so there are a lot of options within a given school, particularly with the, the public school systems that we have in our area, 
Um, there are a number of special diplomas where you can choose to focus on, say, global studies and languages, and you'll get a distinction when you graduate. And we've mentioned dual enrollment a couple times. So it is, it is kind of in your best interest to make sure that you are, understand what opportunities are available to you at your school so that as you go through the, the four years when you're selecting your courses, which usually happens right about now, we've had a lot of students um, in, in March and April ask us about course selection for next year. So as you're looking forward, knowing what options are out there will give you a chance to kind of plan, as we said, your vision for all four years as you're getting closer, um, closer and closer to those upper, upper division classes when you will have a lot more control over what you're taking. Right. And then as Maureen also pointed out, there are opportunities to go outside of your school's curriculum. There's something you're super interested in, you really wanna take an environmental science class and it's not available at your school, look for a way to do it online. Look for a summer opportunity. Often internships in this area can give you credit. Um, or again, we, you live, many of you are in the, the Washington DC area. We have some great local colleges and community colleges that will offer, offer opportunities for high school students. So, one of the ways you can distinguish yourself is to push beyond the boundaries of what your school has to offer. And, um, and know your strengths uh, and your interests. I have many students who uh, consider, um, should, I do the, should I do advanced placement courses or should I do the um, IB program, uh, you know, the junior, senior year, those two years uh, to get that degree um, and that, the um, IB um, diploma. So that question comes up and it really comes down to a conversation of interest and strength and looking at the difference in the two experiences. Um, and that's something that uh, Katie, Katie and I um, discuss with students all the time. And in addition, magnet programs, but, um, but the AP and the IB in particular. Absolutely. So, when you're in this time of year, and maybe you have a chance to talk to Maureen, maybe you don't, maybe your school counselor is available, how do you figure out how to make these decisions? And we, we will look through some of the specific decisions we know a lot of you are facing right now in, in slides coming up. Um, but these are some ways to start. Your teachers have a really good sense. So see what they recommend. If your teacher says to you, I know you can do this with an honors class, then that, that's a good sign. If your teacher says to you, ooh, I don't know, I don't know that this is something you're, you really are thinking uh, that you wanna put in this extra work for, that's also good to kind of talk to them about. Um, look at your grades. If you're getting straight C's in one of your on-level classes, you're probably not prepared to take the AP level class. Also, also some well, schools do have um, particular suggestions for students as they move through the four years. So you'll want to, um, talk with your teachers about about that, your counselor, perhaps. Yes, and some of that is available online. It's called course sequencing, and you can see, okay, if you're in the math class I'm in now, what is the typical recommendation for next year? So let's walk through some of the classes. We're going to each of the core subjects that we um, that we see students having the opportunity to take these. Uh, higher level courses in, and kind of walk you through what that looks like for a typical student. So I'll, I'll start us off with English and then I'll jump it over to Maureen. I think math is next. Um, so in English, I was an English teacher, so I love talking about it. Um, the, the AP course that many, many students take at all of the different schools that we work with is AP Lang and Lit. Uh, there, is, there is an additional senior year AP Lit course, but this course is usually offered in junior year. So are, you are usually considering it at the end of your sophomore year. And it's an interesting question because often there are not honors English courses in freshman and sophomore year. So this might be the first time you've kind of asked yourself this question of what am I willing to kind of jump into this level? And this course does require a lot of independent work. One of the main differences with AP courses in general is that there is a, a much greater expectation that you are willing and able to do some independent learning um, and to reach out to your teacher. I would say over my years as a teacher and then as um, a dean and a high school principal, 
the conversation I had more than any other conversation was, have you asked your teacher yet? Have you gone to talk to them? You need to go talk to your teacher. And that is particularly true with the AP Lang and Lit class because it is a course that is designed to make sure that you know how to write at the college level. So you will do a lot of writing and it will be more intense writing and more sophisticated writing than it has than you have previously been asked to do. But the flip side of that, the flip side of why would I take this super hard class that Katie just said was gonna require all this extra work is you learn how to write as a college student. You learn how to think and, and communicate at a very high level. And consequently, colleges love that. They know that that's what this course teaches you. So it is very, very high as they are looking at your transcript and evaluating the choices you've made. Um, AP Lang is a signal to them that you are a real scholar and you are ready and prepared to think and communicate at the college level, which is an incredibly important skill. So next up, math. Uh, again, your teacher can be um, very important, a discussion with your teacher in um, deciding the, the, your next um, course, your next course choice. So the, the sequence of your courses is really important here. I mean, math, you're building skills year after year. And you want to at least um, come out of high school with pre-calculus. Um, many students um, do graduate with, with the calculus before they move on to, um, to college. So math takes a lot of practice. And again, like I said, it's incremental growth. It's building on the skills. And there's kind of a track. You know, you, you have to um, master step one in order to go to step two, step three. And your math plan for high school is going to depend on um, where you start freshman year. And you want to sort of um, evaluate each year and to think about um, what we talked about earlier. Is this the right degree of challenge? Am I managing okay, um, you know, and, and being rewarded by my work and moving on and building skills. If you're feeling as if um, freshman year, sophomore year, you, you need a bit of practice, you can, you can uh, uh, formulate a tutoring plan, but again, check to see that you're in the, on the right track because again, you'll want to master material as you move forward year after year. Um, and um, the idea, of calculus versus um, AP stat. So um, this question comes up again and again. Um, calc many colleges want to see that calculus, but it really comes down to the individual student. And uh, as I said, thinking about your strengths and your direction and, um, and then determine from there. Some students do go on to take both. Um, but math is very high on the college radar as in as English is and looking to see again it's that foundational um, skill that um, one takes with them from high school and then continues um, to build as an undergraduate. Right, both math and English are courses that um, colleges expect to see you taking all four years. There are some times where you might uh, jump high enough in math early on in high school to be, that you'd be offered the opportunity to take only three years. Uh, we highly advise against that. Colleges really want to see you taking all four years. Um, and, and there are some majors, there are some uh, particular pathways that you would need to have that calculus. If you want to be an engineer, you probably should stick with calculus. But also, if you want to be an engineer, you probably like calculus. If you wanna be a creative writing major, it's probably not as critical for you. Um, so if you know that you are likely to be more successful in the AP statistics, that's not a bad trade-off. Um, but, but calculus is not something to give up lightly. So you wanna, as Maureen said, just really think about individually where your strengths are and what the overall story of your transcript is going to look like. So kind of along the same lines of science, off of, of math, science often ends up with some of the super challenging upper division classes. So these are courses that is important to really think through what you are excited about. Um, 
every college, for most serious students, they want to see that you have taken biology, chemistry, and physics. Those are really considered the true um, lab sciences. And this is one of the ways that colleges are still very, very traditional. Um, that's kind of a requirement that was put in place 30 or 40 years ago, and they still very much are looking for it. It can even become a little tricky if you are, as Maureen was saying, if you are an IB student, those upper division classes are junior and senior year. So you might end up, for instance, with biology your freshman year, chemistry your sophomore year, and then IB chemistry or biology your junior and senior year and never have physics in the mix. Now that might be a totally fine choice for your transcript and your pathway, but it's something you wanna be thinking about because most schools are looking for biochem and physics. Um, and science is tough. Science, uh, biology is usually the first class uh, for a student where you are expected to read to learn. That's the phrase that teachers use. It means they expect you to be able to read that textbook, which is usually a pretty heavy textbook, and learn things from it, not just learn things in class from your teacher. So there is usually a great deal of reading and it's pretty scientific. Um, for, for some classes, not as much for biology, but certainly for physics and often for chemistry, there is also, um, it's very helpful if you have a, a, a decent amount of math ability. After you get past these three courses, there tend to be at most schools a, a wealth of options. Most schools will offer you an AP option at, in each of these main subjects, so you could take that. Very challenging, but very interesting courses. Um, and then many schools offer environmental science or astronomy or anatomy and kinesiology. This is, and some of those, once you get past the APs, these are a place where you can have some electives that will not be quite as academically challenging. They won't be quite as taxing as the, the lab sciences are but they still can show your college and universities that you're excited about science and that you're someone who takes school seriously, but without maybe pushing yourself to the level of taking an AP chem. Uh, we have a question here, and uh, but I just, I'm gonna make one comment. And remember that the um, sequence of taking uh, biology, chemistry, physics is different for, for students um, right. across the board. And the, um, again, the degree of rigor will be different. It's, it's different um, for each student, depending on, um, again, their strengths, and do they wanna do AP Physics, AP Chem, or um, um, a range and honors pattern. But we have a question, is it bad if you don't take AP Calculus if you have taken honors math classes for the past three years? So is it, it so this really comes down to um, a conversation to say, um, okay, what are you gonna? What are you working on senior year? If you, um, where do you go, want to go with your math? Um, and what, what schools are you looking at um, as far as uh, colleges and universities? Uh, because if your competition is going to have the calculus, um, you've been in honors math classes, and um, you, you're you're ready to, to move on to that calculus and it will be part of um, the, the arena of, of moving um, into um, the college application process, then it's, um, it's worth taking. But again, without knowing all the details, it's hard to just say, take calculus. <laughs> right. I, I agree with Maureen wholeheartedly. You want to ask yourself, what kind of impression is my transcript going to make when the college looks at all of it? And so if you are dropping calculus entirely in favor of a different math class, or if you're dropping down from the AP uh, down to an on-level calculus class, um, is the rest of your coursework still demonstrating your rigor and your commitment? Or does it look like you thought, whew, I've been working so hard, I wanna take it easy senior year. If it's that second one, then maybe bump yourself up a little bit. But if, if your choices are still really intentional, then, then you might be in great shape. It just really depends on kind of the story you're trying to tell. So Katie, if you took AP, um, AB Calc, would you take BC or STATS the following year? Uh, if you took AB Calc as a junior, 
Uh, and we will look at some case studies in a moment, but if you took AB Calc as a junior and I'm a college admissions officer, I would be really curious why you did not take BC Calc as a senior. I agree. I, agree. I would expect that unless there's a super compelling reason to jump over to stats, um, I would probably stick with the calculus track because it would be it would be a pretty unusual choice. Again, there's always ex there's exceptions to literally every rule. That's why there's not just a formula for college admissions. Um, but typically, if you're already in that calculus uh, AP track, you want to stick with it. I can't actually see the questions on my screen anymore, so I'm glad Maureen is keeping on top of them. They've, they've disappeared. All the Zoom functions have disappeared from my screen. Whoops. Uh, let's keep going. So the one place that you could, remember I said you don't want to lighten your, your core subjects in math or, or English, and actually that's really true for science as well. If you're looking at any of the selective universities, you really want to try and have four years of each of those core classes. But history and social science is a place where you can lighten your load a little bit if you'd like. It's just not considered in quite the same context as the others. Um, everyone does really wanna see that you have taken US history and many of our schools and uh, systems in the area also require for graduation that you take a state or city history. Um, History and social science is usually seen as a mark of a curious mind that if you are taking history, social science courses all four years, maybe you take a, an economics class or AP human geography. It's usually a place where it, um, it signals to colleges that you're a critical thinker and that you're kind of excited to dig in to learn about people and history and, and civilizations. Um, you will again probably do a lot of reading on your own and a lot of writing. So it is a great preparation for, for college. If you do opt for the AP options, AP US history or world history or European history or some of the um, AP social sciences, those are classes that, that will again indicate to colleges that you've been taught to think and you've been taught to write and you can communicate your great higher level thoughts. So it is, these are great courses to take if you're excited and willing to kind of put in that extra work. But if you are looking for a place to find some balance, then this is probably the first place to look to lighten up a little bit before you would look at, say, calculus or, um, or science. So, for example, if you had the um, AP English Lang, AP Chemistry, um, another AP course, and then you get to history, um, this is the place to take the honors history course, perhaps, yeah. if you also have crew and and uh, play the violin. So, right. you know, it really, um, this would be the place. And you occasionally want to see your family and your friends, have a little fun. Now, this is probably the curriculum battle that we fight the most. Um, foreign language is a tricky thing in high school. For many students, this ends up not being their favorite course. Although I spoke with a wonderful young woman yesterday who was taking two different foreign languages for fun in high school, and I told her I was very proud of her. But that's not where all of us find ourselves. Um, so you do want to take at least three years. I know that for the most part, your high school graduation requirements say something like you need to take two consecutive years or you need to reach the second level of a language. Um, and this is one of the places where there's a real difference between taking, between your graduation requirements and college admissions expectations. And um, it is a, a great sign for you as a serious student if you kept your foreign language for at least three years, maybe four years, um, or if you pushed yourself to the level of taking the AP or the SAT subject test so you have kind of an outside product that says, look, I have totally mastered Chinese or French or Spanish. I feel very strongly about that part. Yes. Absolutely. So once we get past yeah, the core. Some, I'm sorry, be aware that some colleges or universities are gonna have a foreign lang language requirement. Great so, point. Again, um, thinking a bit long-term. Yep. Oh, such a good point. Um, so once you get past the core requirements, particularly as you get to be a junior and a senior, you do have some options for taking things that you're just excited about that high schools call electives, meaning you elected to take them. It wasn't required for you. 
Um, and we see this, there's kind of two different ways that you can handle your electives. Neither one of them is really better than the other one in terms of college, but they just kind of tell a different story. Maureen, do you want to jump into either of these? Um, you know, I was just, we have a science question. <laughs> that our, Go so for it. I'm going to jump. So I wanted to take AP physics, but there were too many uh, complaints about the immense rigor of the course at my school. I'm trying to take physics DE, but there is a bunch of prereq courses that must be taken at the college, even if I took it in school before I can take physics. I'm not sure. Um, so. So is the question about whether to forego physics okay, entirely? So then, okay, dismiss. Okay, never mind. Okay. Okay. Okay, so. Um, we are um, at the, uh, oh, so two pathways for the electives. Yes, do you want to explore an experience and see what, what you're good at? Or do you want to build a particular narrative um, do, in addition to your academic um, interests and in your, in, for example, math and science? Do you want to add um, um, economics in there and, and build that out from, again, this, your narrative, which your, your transcript tells a story. So um, this, do you want to add economics to your story? Or do you, you're in high school, again, back to that foundation, the exploration, um, experimenting and pursuing. Um, do you want to take psychology? I mean, what have you been really excited to take by the time you get to your electives? take what you want to learn about and that can create um, its own narrative. It's a yep. great way to discover, um, you know, you may also be doing that your freshman in the beginning of your sophomore years of college. Um, so that kind of um, just pursuit of different academic subjects is also worthwhile. You don't always have to be building um, an academic major, so to speak. So we wanted to take a look at a couple of students that are pretty typical of questions that we get a lot. So this student is a, a student who is a junior. And this year they were taking on-level English, pre-calculus, physics, AP US, history, and Spanish three. So when you look at it, you kind of have a sense that this student's real strengths and interests are probably in history. That's where they've pushed themselves a little bit. They got an A in it. They have an A in the English class. So they're pretty strong in the humanities. Clearly a strong student across the board. An A in pre-calc is no joke. It's not easy to come by. Mm -hmm. um, but pre a pretty strong student, especially in the humanities. So as they're thinking about senior year, wanting to add a little bit more rigor, particularly since the AP US class has been so successful, uh, I'm trying to figure out kind of where to push them. So the AP US class pretty naturally leads to an AP comparative government class. Um, that class is typically offered as a semester and the other semester would be an AP US government class. So maybe the student will end up taking both of them. Um, and then has decided to stick with the on-level Spanish and English and has decided to stick with taking science, but to shift away from the hard sciences and take something that is um, a little just more appealing, but also a little bit less of an academic uh, weight. The AP Environmental Science, even though it is an AP course, tends to be a little bit um, easier, is not quite the right word, but a little bit more straightforward than maybe the AP Chem or the AP Bio. Um, so it's usually pretty manageable for many students, even if they don't think of themselves as a particularly strong science student. So then the question the student has is, I'm in pre-calc, I don't love it, I did fine, I have a B, but I've had to work super hard for it. Do I push myself for the calculus or do I go for statistics or AP statistics? Um, and I wanna say right away, there's not a right or wrong answer here. When counseling this student, we would ask a lot of the questions that Maureen and I have been referring to before we decide the right choice for this student. Um, so if this student is aiming really high in college admissions, if she's thinking about really selective schools or if she's thinking about being something in the sciences, or math fields as a possible major if maybe she wants to do computer science or nursing. 
then it might be a good idea to really push yourself and stick with the calculus. Um, but since it also feels like the student might not be heading in that direction at all, they might be strong in, across the board, but really where her heart is, is in studying history and she wants to be a, a history major or a political science major, then, then that might be a, a, an argument for statistics, which is still a legitimate rigorous course, but doesn't require the, the super high level math. What do you think, Maureen? Um, I agree. I would, I would um, probably have a discussion with the student really about the idea of um, that they, they're now looking to senior year. They've been, they have the experience of three years behind them. And I would say, what do you think about stretching to this calculus course? Um, you can take AP stat, but what about this and have a conversation um, again, where, where will, what's on the plan for the college applications, right? Remember I said about that, that competition with the calculus, the colleges yeah. like to see that. Um, but if there's a different story, I think what's really critical is um, again, talking out the, the, um, her story here and saying, okay, what's the plan? But also, um, you know, pushing a little bit so that we, um, we create options in the future right. if there isn't um, a current answer as to direction, right? Absolutely. It depends on how, um, how the student, uh, what the student thinks about moving into that calculus course. Schools have all different kinds of details, like uh, uh, students talk about teachers, they talk about um, how classes change from year to year. So mm -hmm. that's the kind of thing we would talk about. Yep. One of the things that an admissions officer told us a couple of months ago is that when they see calculus on the transcript, it's a little bit like that AP Lang class, it's not so much about whether or not you learned calculus. It is just kind of an indicator that you are a serious student who has been asked to think at a really high critical level. So if that's the message that's important to send, then you wanna really kind of think about whether this is a place to stretch. All right, Maureen, you wanna take our next case study? And I just wanna say these tough courses, um, they're teaching you how to learn in addition to teaching you calculus or English or science. Um, and that's really um, a great, great start to your first year of college is um, having these challenges under your belt and saying, okay, I know how to approach um, difficult material. So that's really important. Absolutely. That is a great point. Okay, so sophomore year, that's the year um, that you're planning for a junior year in that AP English. And it looks like this student, um, this student is, has an A. And English, um, we don't know. Uh, so will this student go on to honors or AP? So this is where a teacher um, can come in, come in with some information to have a conversation with this student to find out about this particular English class. I mean, sometimes it was so easy um, that I want to take the leap to AP. But um, the next step might just might be honors as the right fit. So again, it's going to be, um, okay, this is a strength that the student has. Now let's see what the context is for the next move. Uh, perhaps it is the honors English, but uh, let, let's have a look. So I think that, did the slide change, Katie? No. Okay. So yeah, we go. All right. So um, pre-calc. Uh, B plus, great, so moving into that AP Calculus AB. So now we're, we're thinking about, all right, so um, this particular student will be um, in that AP um, Calculus class. So that uh, keeping that in mind for that leap for English and um, moving from AP Chemistry, that's one of the toughest courses in high school, um, it'd be minus and taking that physics, I'm sure that um, student was relieved um, to, to complete that chemistry class and to move into that, to that, um, that physics class and not into the AP physics. So here um, we have a strong history student again who um, has AP NSL sophomore year and then we'll take that next step to um, AP US history. 
Um, French three has a C. It looks like it's gonna be that this student um, perhaps may say, listen, I have French three and um, I don't wanna move on from here. Right. So this could be that, that time when that student picks up um, a direction in electives, but I wanna say the, this is junior year. It is an important academic year as they all are, but this is the, the most recent full year. And this is the time really to, to stretch and to flex your muscles with academics. So that French class, if it is gonna be replaced, it needs to be replaced with an equally rigorous academic course. So again, talking with um, teachers and planning from there, that it's not a simple act of, of saying, okay, shoot, French is gone. It's a, it's a very thoughtful next step in planning what will replace French if that foreign language is just, you, you just can't move to that, to that next class. Um, so the student will have two AP courses um, in calculus and history and loving that history. So then it's really kind of um, the conversation like the calculus versus um, st AP stat conversation about whether um, to take that, that leap to AP and three AP courses or to move to the honors. Yep. And our third case study, this time I deliberately changed the slide, um, also a sophomore. A lot of the questions you will find come up uh, become trickier for sophomores. By the time you get to junior year, you have a little more of a handle on having the choices. Um, so for this student, uh, this student, my guess, has probably, he has probably been tracked to the highest level courses since middle school. So he's taken a lot of honors courses, a lot of APs. And so sophomore year, he's got four honors and one AP. That's a heavy course load. Um, and he's doing quite well, except for that one B in honors chemistry. Um, but it, overall, he's still maintaining pretty strong, um, pretty strong uh, courses. So the honors English with an A really probably means uh, jumping to the AP Lang is the right is the right choice. That would be if I were looking at a student and, and looking at a transcript where a student had an honors English course sophomore year and had a, a strong A in it, and I would be really confused why they didn't take the AP Lang course since it is such a sort of foundational course for most high schools. So I think that's a pretty strong choice. Um, and the same thing with the honors math. My guess, is, my guess is he was in honors math freshman year, stayed in honors math sophomore year, sticking with honors math junior year. And then probably he will end up in an AB calculus his senior year. Maybe he'll jump to BC if he's feeling really excited about calculus, but probably from the honors pre-cal, he'll move to the AP, AB calculus. Um, sticking with the honors in the, in the sciences, my guess is this student would have taken honors biology. So by the time he gets through junior year, he'll have all of those uh, lab sciences, which gives him some flexibility for senior year. Maybe he'll look at taking an AP class then. Um, and then sticking with the Spanish. He's pretty good at it. He's got the honors classes. He's doing well. So the question then comes up with this history class. Most of the schools in the area require either two or three years of history. So presumably he probably took a world history freshman year, took the AP NSL sophomore year. So now he has some space where if he wants to drop that history, he could, he's taking three honors and an AP. But this is like one of those times where I think it's really important to push your brain forward a little bit and think what happens my senior year? Because as we said, history is an okay place to take a little bit of a lighter load. But you'd probably do want to have at least three years if you are thinking about looking at highly selective colleges. And for a student with strong grades like this in honors and AP classes, I wouldn't want him to eliminate the opportunity to be looking at highly selective colleges this early in high school. And so you might want to think, well, okay, so senior year, maybe I'm still in AP English, maybe I'm then in AP Calculus, maybe I'm thinking about an AP Science, maybe I'm thinking about AP Spanish, or maybe I've dropped Spanish, maybe I've reached the end of what my school does. But that might be a time, if I'm looking at three or four APs, 
that might be a place where I want where I'm going to want to drop that history where I maybe want to take a breather. And so then I think I would probably suggest to this student here, since most of this course load is pretty comparable to the rigor he's had sophomore year, that he could stick with history. He doesn't have to stay at the AP level if he's nervous about that, but I would explore some of the history on level courses, maybe US history, um, and also look at the honors and AP offerings just to see how much balance we can have with all those A's it, it sort of suggests that this child could push himself a little bit more. And I think I would probably, probably have him think through that whole set of questions before making this decision. All right. And that's our last case study. Fantastic. There we are. Um, are there any more questions in the box, Maureen? There are. Oh, one just popped up. Let's see what we have. Okay. Okay, so um, back to the physics. So although AP physics is offered at my school, I'm a little afraid of the calc AB plus BC and AP chem course load for my senior year next year. I guess my question is to what extent will me not taking AP physics at school hurt my admissions chances? I'm looking to be an engineer and I know physics is a great path is great for that pathway. So again, we don't we don't know you. So, so we're just we're just making some guesses, but I really appreciate the question. My gut would say if you can manage the AP or an honors physics with the AP calculus um, for a pre-engineering pathway, that's probably your strongest choice. Mm -hmm. um, because they are both really directly related to the kinds of thinking they want to know that you have are able to do when you get to um, to college. Now, don't do it and end up totally, you know, doing all the other things wrong that we talked about with eliminating all of your good things in life or getting a D or any of the sort of negative consequences. But, but if it's something that is within your wheelhouse that you can manage it, and my guess is it is if you're in the AP Calc, um, then probably the AP Physics is the right choice for you. And, and know that, um, that I, I just want to make a comment to hurt about hurting admission chances that there are many, many, many schools out there and that they are uh, very supportive of students so that they, um, they're they looking at all different scenarios coming in. So this really, it's, okay, what's your plan and what's your idea of where you wanna go next? And, that, and it's very specific um, and, and so, but you want to think about, again, that balance and how much you can handle. But the advanced physics is something that engineers um, usually uh, kind of just select and, and make choices toward. Right. But Maureen's right to emphasize it's an extremely individual process. So these are kind of guiding ideas, but they're not hard and fast rules. There's an exception for every one of these rules that we just, that we just gave you. So if there are other questions, again, our email addresses are on the screen, um, our Twitter handles, you can always hashtag PMTV, um, but please, please reach out if you have additional questions for us. And um, thank, thank you so much for joining us. So much for joining us. Have a great, great evening.